Hi, my name is Justin. My wife, Ange, and I are the pastors here, and we want to welcome you to the House Guadalajara. Uh, each week, we've been doing these videos for, I don't know, a year and a half now, something like that. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, obviously, we also do this in Spanish. Uh, actually, our meetings every week are in Spanish. They're here in this location, and if you're ever in town in Guadalajara, we would love to meet you. Um, that's probably not practical for a lot of people, so we will continue to have videos available as we are able in English. Um, I want to talk about a topic today. Um, it's been on my heart for a long time, to be honest. I've kind of stayed away from it because it's, it's a big topic, and it's one that's, it has a lot of nuance, uh, a lot of complexity to it, in a sense. At the same time, it's really, it's really simple or really like in your face. And I think more so than ever, with the prolifer proliferation of social media, Everybody has an opinion on everything. I mean, we always did, but now we can now we can like broadcast it to the world. And so, you know, you just you come across a barrage of people criticizing one another, um, criticizing the way people act or think or believe or uh, you know relate the way they love, the way they eat, the way they exercise. Like you can't hardly do or say anything in a public forum without somebody. Um, somebody criticizing it, usually many people. And I, you know, I th that's normal. I don't think it's totally unhealthy all the time, but obviously it gets out of hand sometimes. And the Bible says, has a lot to say about it. Uh, not about social media, obviously, but it does have a lot to say about this idea of judging one another. And I wanted to jump into this topic, and I, I mentioned already I've, I've stayed away from it a little bit because I think it's hard to, I think it's hard to communicate totally. I think it's hard to even understand totally because it's something that is so, like we do it so often. We judge situations and people and, and ideas and we need to. Like it's a, it's a part of, of life is trying to figure out is this good or bad? Is this beneficial or is this harmful? And so like we have to do this all the time. We have to, we have to read something and decide if it's accurate. Uh, we have to I don't know, get advice from a doctor and decide if we're going to follow it. We have to hear an interpretation of the Bible and decide if we agree with it. So you can't get away from the idea of, of judging things or ideas or people, figuring out what you think about something. And yet it, is, it, is, it just so quickly leads to kind of this toxicity. You know, we've all seen it, like a, you know, a, a critical approach towards life in a, in a negative way or gossiping or just kind of cancel culture, rejecting people. There's a lot of things that, that happen that I think we would all, to some extent, you know, maybe not, we wouldn't necessarily all agree on what's right or wrong or, or where the line is, but I think we can kind of all visualize and understand that there is a place at which it's not healthy to always have an opinion about everything or to always criticize or critique everybody. It's just not even... It's not even, you're not even a fun person to be around when you're in that, in that kind of mode. Um, none of us are, and I think it happens to all of us, particularly when we don't get enough sleep or when we're hungry or stressed out or whatever. You know, we'll get in this mood, uh, this, uh, this kind of mode where it's like everything's bad and we just criticize it all. And I, I think we all know that that's not necessarily healthy. But yet you can't just be like, okay, I'm never going to evaluate anything. I'm just going to, you know, be happy all the time and never have an opinion. It's like that doesn't work either. So... I, I wrote down a few things, and I'm going to read a passage in Luke 6. This is one that I think about pretty regularly. Uh, and then there's a bunch more, but I, I know I'm not going to have time to read them all. But let me read this one, Luke 6, 37 through 42. And my wife talked a little bit about this last week. She used a different passage, but she talked a little bit about not judging each other. Um, and I want to talk about that in more detail today. So Luke 6, 37, Jesus is talking, so we should take it seriously. He says, do not judge, and you will not be judged. That's pretty, pretty, pretty blatant. You know, don't judge and you won't be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So it's, it mentions four things here and it's part of a larger context, but he's talking about this idea of reciprocity, like the way you treat others, others is the way you'll be treated. So generosity, forgiveness, empathy, love, compassion, all the things that we want to receive, we also need to give. And I think that makes sense. In that list, though, is the idea of don't judge. Like, kind of like don't be quick to judge. Don't be brutal in your judgment. You know, the way you want to be judged is the way you should judge other people. Um, verse 39, he also told them this parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Verse 41, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, 
Brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye. You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So um, it says a lot here about judging. There's a couple other phrases about the blind leading the blind and a disciple being like their teacher, and that kind of fits within this context, but um, I'm not going to go into those too much. Mostly I want to look at this idea of, especially this last part, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you look at someone and see the speck in their eye and help them if you have a plank in your own eye? And the, the metaphor is intentionally uh, a hyperbole, an exaggeration. No one's walking around with a, a literal physical plank in their eye, but we are actually, metaphorically speaking, sometimes extremely blind, um, extremely limited in our understanding and our perspective, and that's, that's real. And so we're trying to, you know, trying to fix something someone else has wrong, and we, we literally can't even see clearly. That's Jesus' point. It's like, how do you even know that you're seeing something that's wrong if your whole face is covered by a board. You, you can't even tell. So we, we have all these ideas about what's right or wrong with the people around us or the world around us, but we also have some issues within ourselves. So um, I want to jump into this. Why don't we pray to get started, and then I'll make a few comments um, just kind of from my perspective of, of what it means to judge and when we can do it and when we can't, and uh, we'll, we'll see where it takes us. So Lord, we thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you are not only our judge, but you are the one who shows us grace and mercy and compassion and love. We know that we have uh, so much, so much need, so much, uh, so many areas where we're not where we need to be. God, your grace for us is great, and we we trust in that. We we love that. We celebrate that. We know also that you've given us the ability to discern and to understand. Lord, you've called us to be wise, and I just pray that you'd help us today understand. The difference that we would understand how to be how to be wise but not be critical people not to be judgmental people lord you'd help us have the same same spirit that jesus had when he walked on the earth lord to be able to to love people have open minds open hearts open arms lord towards others but at the same time be be really wise about what we're doing In jesus name amen um so this topic uh is actually one that it has has kind of special meaning to me in a funny way because it was the very first thing I ever tried to study in the Bible um, in any in any sort of depth and I was probably like 16 years old 17 years old and I you know I grew up in church so I grew up hearing Bible stories and things like that so it's not like I had never read the Bible I, I, you know, I've read the Bible since I was a kid but I never had really tried to like understand a topic that didn't make sense to me and this particular topic was I still remember was just so frustrating to me because. Um, I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. I'm the oldest child of six. Um, my name, Justin, literally means justice. And I, you know, I've always had kind of this, like my parents still laugh how when we were kids, uh, my br twin brother and I would, they would buy us a large fry to split at McDonald's because it was cheaper than buying two individual French fries. And so we would, we would count them literally one at a time and make sure we had the exact same number of French fries. That's just the way I kind of think. Um, I've gotten better. I still won't share my French fries. That, I think that trauma has been imprinted on my brain since I was a kid. Um, but this idea of justice was really real to me, this idea of like, that's right, that's wrong, that's good, that's bad, that's black, that's white. And when you're 16, you, 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 everything is black and white. Like you don't have, I don't think, the same understanding of, of nuance and complexity, which is also something Angela talked about last week. Um, so anyway, I got out this book called The Strong's Concordance of the Bible. It's, it's literally like a thousand pages. It's this big, huge thing. It was, I think it belonged to my, my uncle or my grandpa or somebody. And I found it in his house. And I'm like, I'm going to study the word judge. And a, and a concordance of the Bible lists all the uses of that particular word. So I looked up the word judge and judging and judgment. And uh, to my surprise and horror, there were over 500 uses of that word in the Bible. And so I was, you know, there's no way I'm going to figure this out at age 16. How am I going to go through 500 uses of the Bible and try to understand what it means? And so I started, I, I, some, I don't think I have any more for sure, but I, in a notebook I was writing down. This was obviously pre-internet, pre-computers, uh, pre any sort of digital search. It was like this literal book that I'm like going down and trying to figure out what in the world it means to judge and not judge. And, I, and I, I gave up after a few, I don't know, probably hours of, of study. And, and it, it just sort of sat in the back of my brain from then on. I mean, I've thought about that, I don't know, dozens of times over the course of my life, the time that I try to figure out what I meant to judge, because it still frustrates me. It still confuses me. Are we or are we not supposed to judge things around us? Are we, are we supposed to look at someone and say, that's wrong? Or are we supposed to be like, oh, you know what? I can't judge. That's in God's hands. Like, are we supposed to look at a, 
an action, a situation, a belief system, um, a moral choice, and, and pass judgment on it? Or are we just supposed to kind of like be like, well, whatever, you know, they're their own person, and I have, I have no say in the matter. Then if you look through the Bible, and I'm not going to read 500 verses, um, but if you look through them, you will find what appear to be contradictions. Where, where the one I just read said, judge not, so that you won't be judged. But there's another passage, that, uh, several passages, where Paul writes things like, hey, judge people. Like, use your brain, use common sense. Look at the situations in the church that you're dealing with. Look at the, per the, the way people are talking and pass judgment. Like, make a decision. Um, if, you, if you were to ask people, I think, you know, and I've heard this a lot, so this is not like a scientific research question, but if you were to ask people that aren't maybe Christian or aren't in the church what they think of the church, one of the first things people tend to respond in a negative way is it's a judgmental place. Like that's the idea so many people have of Christianity and all, actually all religion, or most religions, Catholicism would be the same way. They're so judgmental. I can't, I've heard that so many, so many times from people and it's true. Like you, something about religion, something about the Bible, something about God um, or, or morality, it's like it, it often triggers this reflexiness where we want to kind of lock everything down and say, this is right and this is wrong. You're in or you're out. You're good or you're bad. Heaven or hell. It's like we want to separate everything out. And, and the word judge actually means to separate. If you, if you look up the word in the Greek, it literally means to, to kind of like figure out, to separate, to discern, to decide what's right and what's wrong. And it, you know, I'm, I know I'm not in 20, 30 minutes here going to be able to explain this in, in exhaustive detail, definitely not the 500 passages that I mentioned in the Bible, but it's, it's, such, a, um, it's such a presence, like day in, day out kind of experience where you, you come across something online or you see someone's actions, and this could be a peer, it could be someone in your family, it could be a, an authority in your life, it could be the church itself or pastors in your church, it could be the government, um, it could be a person, it could be an, an idea. There's this constant, constant, constant evaluation, and there needs to be in our hearts. Is that right, wrong, good, bad, healthy, unhealthy? Everything from the way you eat to the way you sleep, the way you walk, your posture, you can always find someone to criticize you, and you can always find someone who agrees with you. Um, so I wrote down a few thoughts, and this is my best attempt at, um, at trying to kind of figure out how to navigate this, because that was, if, if I was 16 at the time, I'm 44 now, so that was 28 years ago. That's a long time uh, to have the same question in your mind, and I'm, I'm finally sitting, sitting down and trying to say what, well, and actually I've done it a few times since then, but never an exhaustive study. I gave up on the exhaustive idea. Now it's more of a experiential study, like in my own life. How do I do this? How do I determine, how do I decide who I can judge or how I should judge or what that should look like? And I have not arrived yet. Um, there's a lot of things I'm still trying to learn here, but I, I do feel like the, the past couple of years in particular, I've really had some understandings and some breakthroughs in my own heart um, in, a, in, a, in a really good way, I think, about what my role is and particularly what my role isn't as a Christian, as a person, as a pastor, as even a father with my own kids, uh, as a husband to my wife, like who am I supposed to judge or critique or evaluate and, and who am I not? And what am I supposed to evaluate and what am I not? And how am I supposed to do that? So I'm gonna, guess, I'm gonna just give you a few things here. I, you know, I think before I jump into that, um, I think probably we all understand, if you just think about it, you know, we understand that the motivation is really what matters um, because if I'm looking at a person and responding to them with a motivation of like fear like I'm afraid of what they're saying or I'm intimidated by it or they make me feel insecure because they're more successful than me um, or if it's a reaction of just selfishness in general like if I if I'm thinking about me um, the way I judge them is going to be skewed okay that's I think that's what Jesus was talking to about the whole plank thing so our motivations really matter. On the flip side, if I'm thinking in love, if I'm really genuinely thinking, okay, how do I help that person? Like, do I need to help that person, first of all, and how do I help them? At that point, it's a lot healthier. So we'll talk some, about some particulars and all this and specifics, but I think that motivation is really important. And it's also important to recognize that that motivation is extremely hard to discern because none of us are ever gonna say, oh yeah, I'm super selfish right now oh yes, I'm acting in fear. Like we don't say that. We always find ways to say, you know, I'm doing good here. I'm doing this in a, in a, for a good reason. But, but are we? Like a, 
a lot of times we're not. Sometimes we're not, or it's a mix of motivations. And so you really do have to be open to the Holy Spirit. Um, you have to be open to God to, to kind of show you if your reaction to someone else is healthy or if it's actually more of a, more of a negative, self-focused, fearful, fear-based reaction. And I'm got, not going to try to get into that too much right now, but it's a question I, I ask myself all the time. And I, and I think it's the first question we need to ask ourselves. Kind of why am I reacting this way? So um, let me just give you five, five things real quick. Um, and then I have a couple more concluding comments. So these are, these are just five thoughts about how, how we should judge. And you can apply them to people or to scenarios, but particularly to people, because that's what we deal with most. I, I think it's not too, you don't get into too much trouble when you're trying to evaluate maybe an idea uh, or, or a, a thought process or, I mean, a, a thought or something like that. Usually those things you can, you know, they're relatively impartial, re relatively non-emotional. Although not always, because there are some ideas that are very important to engage with, and sometimes we resist them out of fear. But really, where where we tend to get most maybe hurtful or or aggressive is when it comes to people, people in our lives, who for one reason or another are doing something we don't approve of. Um, so you can probably think of someone right now in your life who doesn't approve of you. You probably could be your mother-in-law, uh, could be your neighbor, could be your kid, your teenager. There's, there's probably somebody in your life right now who you can say, yeah, that person, it's like no matter what I do, it's always wrong. No matter what I say, there's always a problem with it. Um, you might have a friend in your friend group that's like this. They just, they're, the, they're the first person to criticize, to see what's wrong. Um, you know, maybe there's some personality attached to that. Maybe there's just a bad habit attached to that. I don't know. I'm not here to judge. The thing is, um, we, we want to make sure we do it in a good way. We don't want to burn bridges. We don't want to hurt people. We don't want to reject people that might actually be like, there to help us. So how do, how do we respond? Number one, first thing I, that I think we need to do is before we judge people, we need to judge ourselves. So I'm gonna talk five things about how to judge. But before you judge others, judge yourself. And I could actually spend the rest of this time on this one. This is exactly, in my mind, this is exactly what Jesus was saying when he said, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So think about that just for a minute. What, what is Jesus trying to say when he says, first take the plank out of your own eye? Because he could have said, hey, it's not up to you. Just ignore it. It's like, it's his eye, you know, leave him alone. He's, he's got two hands, two eyes. He can take care of himself. But, but he, he takes the time to say, you know what? Maybe that speck is there. Maybe it isn't. Maybe it's where you think it is. Maybe it isn't. But let's talk about you. Let's, let's talk, let's bring this back to you. And I think a lot of times when we see something in someone else that bothers us, God actually wants to do something in us. And if our reaction is instantly to be like, wham, and just come down on top of that, per on, on that person, on their attitude, on that, whatever it is, and just against them and attack them, or if it's defensive and, you know, you shut ourselves off, we shut ourselves off from that person, or if it's um, dismissive and we find ways to kind of ridicule them and to, and to kick them out of our lives or to label them so that we don't have to listen to them, all those reactions, they really beg the question that God's trying to accomplish in our own hearts. They, they really, they, they distract from the topic at hand. They distract from what maybe God wants to do in us. So when you find yourself frustrated, angry, upset, um, fearful, insecure, whatever, by someone else, before launching into a tirade about how they're wrong, before just saying, I'll unfollow, you know, I'm not gonna even listen to them, it's really actually helpful to ask yourself, why am I responding this way? What is it about that person or that idea that is so threatening to me or that is so offensive to me? What is it about? What, what are they, like, where are they coming from? And several things happen when we do this. And I, I think that this, you know, I don't know if Jesus had all these in his mind when he talked about, was talking about taking the plank out of your own eye, but I think there are genuine benefits of doing this. That process of Deplanking your eye. I don't think that's a word. I made it up. This process of removing this beam, this stick, this giant chunk of wood out of your eye. What, what exactly happens in that? Well, there's a, there's a few things that happen. I want to make sure I remember all these because I wrote several of them down. Um, first of all, the obvious one is you see better. That's Jesus' point. Like, take it out. You know, if you, so, so maybe um, to make this more specific, more concrete, maybe someone says something about some hot button issue in politics, right? And I'm not even going to name some, but think about one, whatever one is most intense to you right now. Um, someone says something and they're on the opposite side of where you, you are, or, or maybe they're not, maybe they're just 
blatantly ignorant. You know, there's, what they're saying is like wrong and you can see it and it makes you angry because what they're saying is possibly gonna hurt other people. That emotional response that we feel isn't, I don't think it's wrong, but it does need to lead us to say, okay, I'm gonna ask myself first, how am I not seeing clearly? Where am I not seeing clearly? What am I not, it doesn't mean I'm wrong and they're right. It just means that I don't see the whole picture. So removing the plank means you get a bigger picture. You step back and you say, okay, what am I not seeing? How can I look and see and understand better than I did before? They see something that you don't. Now it might be wrong. They might be totally wrong. That's entirely possible, but you don't know. Like you can't know until you get a bigger picture, until you're able to see more clearly. And I think Jesus is saying the first thing we need to do is see clearly, see the bigger picture, look beyond just the plank in our own eye. The second thing that this does, and I'm still talking about evaluating yourself, it actually, it's, it's an, it awakens empathy, it creates empathy in us. When we take the time to, to see things through their eyes, when we say, okay, why are they that way? What are they, what are they angry about? What are they angry about? Not just what am I angry about, what are they angry about? What are they frustrated about? What are they afraid of? What are they losing in this whole process? That awakens empathy and empathy will always help. Again, they might still be wrong. You might go through this whole process and be like, well, you know, I feel their pain, but like they're still wrong. They, they, they shouldn't have done that. They brought this on themselves. But often I find that empathy produces mercy. It produces understanding in a way that kind of keeps you from being so quick to pass judgment. It, it's like by the time you're done feeling empathy, by the time you're done putting yourself in their place and awakening, like kind of seeing a connection between the two of you, you, you've already put yourself in a, in a healthier place and you're not so quick to judge. And the third thing it does, this is all still under number one. So you see better, uh, you develop empathy. And the third thing is you, you often realize they're not as wrong as you thought. They might still be a little bit wrong. They probably are, but you might realize you were also partly wrong too. And you find like a meeting place. You find maybe a third option, something that's not what you thought and it's not what they're thinking, but it's, it's something that mixes the two. Um, you don't lose anything. Even if at the end of the day, even if you do all this and you take out the plank and you see bigger and you think empathetically and you try to try to understand where you might be wrong, if, if at the end of the day you still say, I mean, I did all that and I'm, I'm still pretty sure I'm right, you haven't lost anything. So there's no threat involved in this process, but there is a lot of love involved in it. And you will almost invariably find that you've changed in some way. So judge yourself first. That's probably the most important thing in this whole list, um, maybe, but there's a few others. So number two, judge only when necessary. I think what I was missing when I was a kid was, you know, it was like black and white. You either always judge or you never judge. So I would flip flop and I would be like this, like especially with my brothers, like always judging, everything's wrong. With it, look at they're late, they're this, they're that. And then, and then I would get kind of convicted that no, I shouldn't judge so much. And so I'd be like, okay, well, whatever, do, do whatever you want. Who cares? You know, I'm not, it doesn't matter. I'm not, I'm just your brother. And then, and then I'd be like, well, that's not good either. And you just pendulum back and forth between extremes. That's probably typical of being a 16 year old in a lot of ways. Um, but as you get older, as you get more experience, you realize there is nuance to things. It doesn't have to be either or. Either I always judge or I never judge. So some of this, a lot of this has to do with just kind of finding that, that complexity, that nuance. In the case of this, this one, number two, judge only when necessary. What I'm saying is don't let that be your first resort. Like your first thing shouldn't be, okay, well, what do I think about this? And I'm gonna tell them. Like your first response should be, oh, you think something different than me, why? or even, okay, and you move on. Like you don't have to have an opinion about everything. Um, that's revolutionary today, it seems like, but you, you, you really don't, it's not like a poor reflection on you if you don't know what you think about something. Um, you know, a lot of the term mansplaining gets thrown around a lot and it's a, it's a thing, it's a real thing. You know, men always having an opinion on something. And um, I am a man, so I've, I, I've seen it, you know, I've seen this idea and I, you know, I'm sure there's women that do it too, but men in particular, in particular, it seems like we've kind of been taught, like you have to know something about everything uh, or there's something wrong with you. And it, it's dumb, it's not even real. Like I, I shouldn't have to have an opinion about everything, um, especially not when it comes to talking with a woman. And that's kind of where mansplaining comes in. It's like men always think they have to have an opinion with something, with, with, with what a woman says. And that's, it's just not even, it's not even logical or normal or healthy in any way. So, um, and I'm not just talking about mansplaining this. I'm, I'm talking really about this idea of having an, an opinion about everything. You, you don't need to, and you definitely don't need to have an opinion about every person. 
it's very valid and it's very healthy and it's very humble to say sometimes I don't know. I don't know. I, what do you think? And, and then you move on. It takes a lot of pressure off. Um, there's a passage in Romans. It's, it's, a, it's a fairly long passage, but if you want to read it later, you can. Romans 14, 3 through 13. I'm just going to read the first part. He says, Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. It's kind of a mic drop moment. Like, who are you to judge someone that reports to God? Like, God's, a, God's in charge. You don't have to have an opinion about what they're doing or not doing. There, there are a lot of times, a lot of times in life, when what someone else is doing is beyond our pay grade. It's, not our, it's none of our business. And I, sometimes it is our business, but that's what I mean by judge only when necessary. Like, there are times that it's necessary. I have to know if what my kids are doing, especially when they're younger, is right or wrong. As a parent, that's important. Um, I should care about what my authorities are doing. That's also important. But this passage where Jesus is talking that we read a second ago in Luke, it's, it's your brother. It's like a peer level thing. That's an important distinction. You don't have to judge every person around you. A lot of times you can be like, wow, that's different. And then you just move on because they might be right and you might be wrong. So anyway, I can say a lot more about that, but I'm going to skip to the next one. Number three, judge humbly because you don't know the whole story. Um, so number one was judge yourself first. Number two was judge only when necessary. And number three is if you do have to judge, judge humbly because you don't know the whole story. There is no way you know everything that's going on. So if you do have to judge, if you find yourself in this position where you do have to make a decision, maybe it's somebody in your life where what they're doing is potentially harmful for you or your family and you have to decide, I'm, how am I going to respond? Like sometimes you literally have to decide. At least do it humbly. At least do it with the recognition that you could be wrong. And, and that's where a lot of this, a lot of times we mess up because we do have to make a decision. We have to make a judgment call. Like it's in front of us. We have to. But we do it with such speed and such arrogance and such just this quickness of like, nope, this is what it is. And then we close ourselves off to future discussion. And I think that's, I think that's an error. I, you can read the book of Proverbs and discover that's definitely an error. You don't, we should not have such concrete, instant, you know, massive decisions about things all the time. It, it, it should be like, well, this is what I think. This is my conclusion so far but I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to listen. That doesn't mean you never come to a decision. Sometimes you evaluate the evidence and you'll say, well, this is what I think, because you have to act on it. You have to make decisions and move on with life. But it means you're not like set there. You're not digging your heels in and saying, I'm never moving. This is the hill I'm gonna die on. We don't need so many hills to die on. There's, why? You only have one life. Just figure out what things really, really matter. But most of the things in life, they are a little bit of a moving target as far as trying to figure out what's, what's right or where you, need, where you, where you really should put all your time and effort. Number four, um, judge with mercy because you could fall too. Um, the Bible talks about this uh, on multiple occasions. Judge with mercy because you, you're fallible as well. I, we have to remember we're not perfect either. Um, and, and, you know, judgment, uh, there's a verse in James. Let me read this one. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So it's not saying never judge, but it's saying judge with mercy. Judge with grace. Judge with compassion. Judge with love. Or it's better just not judge at all. If you can't include that, that attitude of love and mercy in your judgment, something's wrong. And maybe you shouldn't be judging at all. It's a, it should be a big red flag. If you find yourself just passing judgment and passing condemnation out left and right and telling everybody who's right and wrong, even if it's in your own mind, even if you're not talking, but if you're in your heart, you just everything you know that you're right about everything, it should be a bit of a red flag because there needs to be this massive amount of love and compassion and mercy mixed in because you and I are also fallible. We need mercy. We need so much mercy. And I think that's... I think that's one of the things that stops me in my tracks sometimes when I'm, when I'm about ready to just say some judgmental thing, or actually probably more often than that, after I've already said the judgmental thing, and, make, and then I realize, hey, that wasn't smart, is this understanding that, hey, I need mercy too. I'm, I've made mistakes in so many things. And the last one, number five, judge hopefully because people can change. Judge hopefully because people can change. In other words, don't lock them into where they are now. Yes, you might need to say what that person did was wrong hurtful, harmful, um, dumb, whatever. But 
there needs to be in the back of your mind or in the front of your mind this understanding that that's just a that's just where they are right now like the action wasn't good you know the words were wrong or hurtful but the person has hope because that's how god sees them it's how god sees you and me as well and he I, I just I can't emphasize enough the importance of keeping that in mind. It's so tempting. It's so like satisfying in a weird way to write people off, to be like, well, they're gone, you know, they're they're out. They they blew out. It's one too many times. They're they're just. I'm never gonna think about them again or talk about them again or look at them again or, or listen to them again or whatever. And it and it feels a little bit satisfying in a vindictive way because they hurt you, and so for you to write them off or write them out of your story kind of feels like, well, I showed them. And again, you know, there are people that probably you will have to keep at arm's distance or exclude from your life for one reason or another. I know that happens sometimes if they're continuing to harm you, but they can still change. Life is really long. And I've been around long enough to see this happen with people that I thought would never change, would never, that relationships that would never be restored, and, and they are. Um, it, and it's made me think I, I need to be careful about not just saying that person is done and gone and they blew it and they're, they're never, I'm never gonna think about them again. It, it, just, it just doesn't work that way. Um, people, you still run into them, you still see them, you still talk to them, especially if it's someone in your family, especially if it's someone that you've, that you've related to in some way or a, a person in your job or a person in your friend circle. It's like, yes, we need to be willing to have hard conversations. And yes, we need to probably at times make limits, draw limits. But we don't need to do it in such a way that just dismisses the person or dismisses their opinion as if we were the only ones that were right and we were the only ones that have everything under control. We don't. We're fallible. We need mercy. We need patience. We've made mistakes. There's hope for them and there's hope for us. I think a lot of that is what was wrapped up in Jesus' words here. Don't judge and you will not be judged. Don't condemn and you won't be condemned. Just imagine how free a lifestyle like that would feel if we all were able to adopt this mindset of I'm not the judger, the judge. I'm not the condemner. That's not my role. That's not my calling. It's not my grace. Yes, sometimes we have to judge, but we're not the judge. We're brothers. We're sisters. We're friends. We're humans on a broken planet. We've got a lot of problems, but we need one another. If we could just have that mentality, instead of always passing judgment, if we were, if we were open, open-hearted, open-minded to people around us, th that's the kind of lifestyle, the kind of attitude I think Jesus is describing here. Do not judge, you won't be judged. Like, how would feel to not always feel like people are judging you? Don't condemn, you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you'll be forgiven. The freedom that's connected to that, give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, press down, shaken together, right measured to you. It, to me, it speaks of openness. It speaks of this open-mindedness, which to me is a, a willingness to learn, where you have an open mind, so you're willing to hear new ideas, you're willing to change your mind. Someone else thinks something, and you think something different, and you can still be friends, you can still be close, you don't have to like force everybody to think your way. To me, it, to, it speaks about being open-handed, this idea of generosity. I'm not going to lock everything down and get defensive about everything I'll give. God's given me to help other people. To me, it speaks of open hearts. We have an open heart, meaning we can love everyone. We can love anybody. Even people that have hurt us. Even people that aren't on the same page as us in some way. It talks about open arms, which means we receive people. We're able to bring them into our lives, even if they're different than we are. That's the kind of church I imagine. It's the kind of husband I want to be, the kind of father I want to be. The kind of Where instead of pushing people away, and finding reasons to label them and dismiss them, instead of having a long list no longer think about or talk about or care about, instead of having something wrong to me. And I know those things happen, and that's the crazy thing here. That's why this is a little bit of a tricky topic, because I do have people and things, you know what I mean? Like, those are there. I want to define my life that way. I don't want to live my life always adding to that list treasuring that list, valuing that list, making that list the thing that's, that proves how hard I am or how worthy I am. I, really, I want to learn to constantly, continually be an open-minded person. 
I'll still come to conclusions. I'll still determine that wasn't okay. I don't like that. I don't agree with that. I'm not going to live that way. Like I will do all those things, but I don't want to do them out of pride or out of fear. I want to do them in a, in a wise way, in an open handed way. And probably more than anything else in a, in a loving way. Jesus, don't you? That's how he lived. And he knew everything, and yet you don't see him going around calling down fire and brimstone on people. You don't see him mocking people for their wrong ideas. The only people he really <laughs> were the know-it-alls, the Pharisees. The <laughs> but they were the ones that Jesus continually called out. Everybody else, he was really open-handed with. An open heart, open life, open <laughs> goal that I think God has for us. And I want to finish. Um, I know there's probably a lot of things in, in each one of our lives that are, are triggers that cause pain. And, I, and I'm not trying to override those or say that you need to just get It's not what I'm saying in the slightest. I'm saying actually let's just ask God to fill us with a greater level of love and help us be slower to judge. Things, it would take us a long way. So we would just have a bigger and it'd be a little bit a little bit slower um, to resent them, resist them, label them, dismiss them, and judge them. Why don't we pray together? Lord, we thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you, us, um, that you give us so much. We put our lives in your hands today, and we just ask that you would help us have uh, the ability to, to judge things well, to make decisions, to understand things, to be really open-minded as those around us. We thank you for your love. Thank you for your guidance and your, your blessings, your protection in us through us. Thank you for the families and the friends you've given us, for the people that you've given us. Um, the ability that we have and the, and the, the Lord to, to reach out to other people, to serve and love and give in our lives today. And I just pray that this week or the next few days, you would help us to be those people with big hearts. Serve them in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. For your time today. Um, went a little longer than I expected, but I kind of knew I would, I guess, because there was so much to cover. But um, I just wanted to Thank you for joining our website, thehousemexico.com, has more here as well. And as I said at the beginning, if you're ever in town and you want to visit, please do so. Uh, if you would like to contribute financially, there is a link on that website, thehousemexico.com. We're excited about a lot of the things that are happening, um, some of the missionary, uh, ministries and things that we're doing to serve people. And if you need more information, you can always reach out as well. And uh, anyway, just thank you for joining us. Bye.